Gaia, Mother Goddess Earth in Ancient Greece. The island of Ithaca, the home of Odysseus. The Homeric Hymn to Gaia, written down in the 5th century BC. Gaia, mother of all, the oldest one, the foundation. I shall sing to earth. She feeds everyone in the world. Whoever you are, whether you walk upon her sacred ground or move through the paths of the sea, you who fly, she is the one who nourishes you from her treasure store. Queen of Earth, through you, beautiful children, beautiful harvests come. You give life and you take life away. Blessed are those you honour with a willing heart. They who have this have everything. Their fields thicken with bright corn. The cattle grow heavy in the pastures. Their house brims over with good things. The men are masters of their city. The laws are just, the women are fair. Happiness and fortune richly follows them. Their sons delight in the ecstasy of youth. Their daughters play, skipping in and out. They dance in the grass over soft flowers. It was you who honoured them, generous goddess, sacred spirit. Farewell, mother of the gods, bride of starry heaven. For my song, allow me a life my heart loves. And now, and in another song, I will remember you. In the West, we know Gaia as the mother goddess of ancient Greece. Yet her origins lie in ancient India. She was brought from India to Europe by the Mycenaean tribes when they arrived in Crete around 2000 BC and later came to Greece. Gaia first appears in Sanskrit, in the old Indian Vedas and the Upanishads, where the Gayatri Mantra was named as the first to come forth from the Om, the original sound. Gayatri has a meaning which expands infinitely to include earth, humanity and all other beings, and was also a story of origin, relating human beings to earth as the image or moving song of the whole. So the Greek Gaia, in sound, image and name, has a long lineage, bringing with her echoes of the origin of the world. When the Mycenaeans reached Crete, they found themselves entering a long-established tradition of the culture of the goddess, beginning with the art of the people of Bronze Age Minoan Crete. This is a Minoan goddess from 1600 BC. Snakes fall from her head, entwine around her neck and coil down her arms to her outstretched hands, bestowing life. And still further back, through the Neolithic cultures of old Europe, 4,000 to 10,000 BC, as this seated goddess, also found in Crete, to the Paleolithic goddesses, as this goddess of Lesbug in France, 20,000 BC, carved out of mamphor ivory. And still further back, the goddess of Holfels in Germany, 40,000 BC, 
the oldest of all. The Mycenaeans were just one of many waves of Indo-European tribes who came from the northern shores of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. They were known primarily as Achaeans after the Achaea region of Greece, the most northern part of the Peloponnese, and this is what Homer calls them when he speaks of them elegiacally in the Odyssey and the Iliad, written down around 700 BC, and telling stories of a time several hundred years before. Their chief divinity was the god Zeus. In Greece, there were already three different stories of origin, reflecting the different groups of people who had come before them. The Pelasgian, the Orphic and the Homeric, all of which share a mother goddess arising out of chaos, darkness or sea, who unites with a serpent or the wind, and from their union, the world comes into being. In Orphic myth, the goddess of black-winged night unites with the wind and lays a silver egg in the womb of darkness. Farnes, god of light or Protagonos, the firstborn, is shown here emerging from the world egg entwined by a serpent. This is a Roman bas-relief from the 1st century AD, a zodiac encircling the world egg. In the Olympian creation myth of the Mycenaeans, named after Mount Olympus, the home of the gods and the closest place to heaven, chaos is first. And then comes Gaia, who gives birth to all the forms that are to come. The fusion of the two cultural traditions, the native European and the immigrant Indo-European, allowed an entirely new narrative voice to appear, one where the timeless images of the ancient goddess cultures could be explored through the narrative of story, inspired by characters belonging to a particular time and place. Hesiod, writing around 700 BC, is the earliest poet to imagine the unfolding stages of creation in his poem Theogony, The Genealogy of the Gods. After an invocation to the Muses, he begins. Chaos was first of all, but next appeared broad-breasted Gaia, sure standing place for all the gods who live on snowy Olympus Peak. Gaia, as the first to arise from chaos, is then the one who presents a cosmos, meaning in Greek an ordering, a harmonious whole. She embodies perhaps the original moment of wonder which made sense of the world, and so was the foundation on which the gods could stand and the mind could rest. This is a stone statue of Gaia from Palicastro in Crete, 3rd century BC. There are not many images of Gaia in Greece, perhaps because being herself the origin, she could be found in everything. Here the flat and heavy stillness of her face evokes one of the Indo-European names for goddess Earth, Plataea, the Broad One. As though the emergence of Gaia releases the structural principles of the universe, Tartarus, the underworld, then appears, followed by Eros, love, most beautiful of all the deathless gods, the web of relationships which binds the world together. From chaos, meaning in Greek abyss, the primeval void of the universe, comes Nyx, night, and Erebos, darkness, who unite to bring forth day and space. As though independent of these more abstract structuring principles, Gaia then gives birth out of herself 
to sky, Uranus, Uranus, and mountains, Orea, and sea, Pontos. Hesiod continues. And Gaia bore starry heaven, first to be an equal to herself, to cover her all over, and to be a resting place, always secure, for all the blessed gods. Then she brought forth long hills, the lovely homes of goddesses, those nymphs who live among the mountain clefts. Then, without pleasant love, she brought forth the barren sea with swollen waves, Pontos, and then she lay with heaven. This is Uranus, heaven, sky. Transforming her son, Uranus, into her lover, in the widespread tradition of sun lovers of the goddess, Gaia gives birth to the next generation of divinities called the Titans. Six goddesses and six gods, among whom were Rhea, the flowing one, embodying the vitality of the life force, expressed in the poet Heraclitus' aphorism as Panta Rai, everything flows. Here's Rhea riding on a lion. Also Themis, whose name means law, goddess of the natural order, prophet of divine law and tradition, goddess of the oracles of Delphi and Dodona, disclosing Gaia Earth as inherently ordered and lawful. And Mnemogene, whose name means memory, mother of the muses, disclosing Gaia as carrying the memory of the whole and herself a prophet, what we might now call the Great Memory. Also Hyperion and Thea, god and goddess of light, gave birth to Helios, sun, Selene, moon, and Eos, dawn. Here's Helios, the sun god, in his chariot of horses, the star figures leaping out of the way. Selene, goddess of the moon, riding her horses. Among other titans were Iapetus and the Oceanic Asia or Clymene, who gave birth to Prometheus, who stole fire from the gods for humans, Epimetheus and Atlas, here seated with Gaia standing beside him. The vertical patterning of her gown recalls the rivulets of the waters of life. And finally, Kronos, the last of the Titans, reveals an earth structured by the changing rhythms of time and season, bringing the virtues of the other goddesses and gods into the condition of life in time, both creation and destruction. It followed that the flow of life, lawfulness, memory, light and dark, temporal rhythm, belonged also to all creation. In contemporary terms, Gaia was a vision of the universe as one dynamic living whole. As we follow the story of Gaia unfolding into creation, it is remarkable how, in the imagination of the ancient Greeks, Gaia was a dynamic force at each stage of creation, conceived as regulating the ongoing process whenever it is arrested. Inevitably, the stages of the Earth's procreation, as imagined by humans on the human model, Gaia giving birth to children who give birth to their children and so on, are also, or rather primarily, stages of the differentiation of human consciousness, trying itself to understand how a world comes into being and also what prevents or inhibits its growing, its impulse to thrive. Yet it is a consciousness closer to the archetypal source than our own, 
at least two and a half thousand years ago. And in that sense, we may be listening to an encoded wisdom we have lost touch with. In the next stage of this story, suddenly there is a hiatus and creation stops. Significantly, it is when Gaia and Uranus bring forth violence and ugliness, when force, not beauty, comes into being. Three huge, violent and ugly giants are born with 50 heads and 100 arms. This echoes the human question, what to do when things go wrong and threaten the integrity of our purpose as we see it. The all too familiar answer of Uranus is to deny it and carry on as before. Uranus hates the giants as soon as they are born and pushes them back inside Gaia's womb so they would not see the light. But this stretches and strains Gaia and she groans mightily. So she thinks of a plan. She brings forth from her body grey iron and forms a sickle with great teeth and asks her children for help. Kronos, time, takes up the challenge. Great Uranus came and with him brought the night. Longing for love, he lay around Gaia, spreading out fully. But the hidden boy stretched forth his left hand. In his right hand he took the great long jagged sickle. Eagerly he harvested his father's genitals and threw them off behind. They did not fall from his hands in vain, for all the bloody drops that leaped out were received by Gaia. From the drops of blood, Gaia brings forth the giants and the Erinyes, the three Furies, goddesses who become guardians of ethical law, and later pursued Orestes for the murder of his mother, also euphemistically called the Eumenides, the kindly ones. Here are two Erinyes in the underworld. Vipers winding round their arms and through their hair. This aspect of the story is known from many other creation myths as the separation of the world parents and inaugurates the next stage of creation now that the structure of the universe is in place. Here it is significant that it is Kronos who acts on behalf of Gaia and sets the drama of life going again. Time now becomes the moving image of eternity in Plato's phrase in the Timaeus. The severed genitals of Uranus, falling into the lap of the sea, come back into life as Aphrodite, born from the foam, Aphros. She is then the first fruit of the separation of heaven and earth, the only divinity to carry within herself the memory of the whole, becoming the goddess of love. Aphrodite's birth from the waves was reenacted every year in spring as a ceremony of rebirth. But when Cronus rules instead of his father, he also prevents life from growing. Cronus united with his sister Rhea, the flowing one, and she brought forth three daughters, Hestia, the firstborn goddess of the hearth, Demeter, goddess of the harvest, and Hera, goddess of marriage and family, and then three sons, Poseidon, god of the sea, Hades, god of the underworld, and lastly Zeus, god of the sky, thunder and lightning, and ruler of the gods on Olympus. Here's Poseidon, god of the sea, also known as the earth shaker and creator of the horse. So the gods form the structural principles of sky, sea and underworld, while the goddesses explore the relation of humans to the given conditions of life, the habitation of earth in the human realm. But Gaia, prescient of all things, had warned Kronos that he too would be supplanted in his turn. So Kronos swallows his children as soon as they are born, devouring time, as Shakespeare has it, except for Zeus, the last born. Again it is Gaia who keeps the dynamic movement of life going. She gives Rhea, his mother, a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes 
to trick Cronus into thinking he was swallowing his last child, and hides the baby Zeus in the Dictaean cave in Crete, where you can still see tiny sculptures of bulls, one of his animal forms buried in the walls. This recalls the ancient affinity between earlier Mycenaean and Minoan rituals of the rebirth of the year god of the spring. Though the seasonal aspect of renewal a thousand or so years later was no longer reflected in the later Zeus of Greece. When Zeus grows up, Gaia helps him to induce Kronos to disgorge his brothers and sisters, still in the state of having been swallowed, and Kronos fights back, and during a ten-year battle, Gaia draws the thunderbolt and lightning out of her depths to allow Zeus to vanquish Kronos, and so to reign himself as king of the gods, the role for which, of course, he was destined long before the patriarchal Mycenaeans reached Greece. Here's Zeus with Thunderbolt and Eagle, Etruscan red figure vase. Zeus is the only deity in the Olympian pantheon whose name has a completely transparent Indo-European etymology, where it means light and day, or rather in its original verbal form, it lightens, it shines. Theos, God, was said in the dynamic moment of revelation, as, for instance, in the dramatic revelations of the tragedies, and so, like many nouns, began life as a verb and lost some of the imminence of divine presence when he later became god of sky, thunder and lightning. Yet, in the oldest temples to Zeus in Dodona, in the north of Greece, it was said that his voice could still be heard when the leaves of the oak trees whispered to the wind. But when Zeus imprisons Kronos and the other titans in Tartarus, the underworld, Gaia objects, and this throws their different values into relief for the first time. Gaia, as mother of all, accepting the ugly and the hostile, excludes nothing from the totality of creation. A battle then ensues between Gaia and Zeus and the other gods, which Zeus wins. Here's Zeus slaying Typhon, son of Gaia and Tartarus, serpent with a hundred heads. And Poseidon fighting the giant Polybates with his trident. Gaia rises from the ground to plead for the life of her son. At this point, the relationship is altered between them and it is the new image of the divine embodied in Zeus which separates out from the source and inaugurates a new set of values, distinguishing more radically between the different forms of creation. Light is seen as antagonistic to darkness, the upper world is set against the lower world of Tartarus, and the new rule of oppositions is born. Many of the Titans who fought against the Olympians were punished by Zeus and imprisoned in Tartarus, the underworld. Atlas was condemned to hold up the sky on his shoulders at the western edge of the world and came to embody the celestial axis around which the heavens revolve. Unsurprisingly, then, there is now a re-evaluation of the matriarchal order a new rule of law. However, in stark contrast to the invasion of the Babylonians into the goddess culture of the Sumerians in 2000 BC, where the lunar and earth goddess Tiamat was violently slain in two, in Greece the old order was brought into sympathetic relation with the new order. So the original inheritance was never lost, mainly because many of the original goddesses retained their spheres of influence and action. This fruitful transformation was achieved by a series of unions between Zeus and the earlier goddesses, either the titan daughters of Gaia and Uranus or the native Pelasgian goddesses. 
and creation continued anew. Greece shows in many subtle ways that it is possible for a goddess culture and a god culture to come together and create a new kind of relationship which can recognise the virtues in each other and honour the sacredness of earth while still retaining their own point of view. In the next stage of this story, Zeus unites with the sisters of his mother Rhea. Themis, goddess of law, daughter of Uranus and Gaia, who brings forth the Horai, the seasons, and the Moirai, the three spinning fates, Clotho, Lachesis and Atropos, the last one, who cuts the thread of life. Here's Themis, seated on the Delphic tripod as the Pythia, the oracle of Delphi, taking over from her mother Gaia. The childless king Aegeus is receiving a prophecy of the birth of his son. This is the new Mycenaean story, but older lineages often break through in alternative tales. The poet Pindar, for instance, says the Moirai were already there, following the gleaming pathway from the springs of ocean to the sacred stair of Olympus in their golden chariot. They themselves, he says, brought Themis to Zeus to be his bride, even before they were born. Zeus also unites with Mnemogene, goddess of memory, who gives birth to the nine muses. We call her Memosine now. Here she is standing on the right, and Calliope, her daughter, she of the beautiful voice, who became goddess of epic song and the mother of Orpheus. Mimogene, holding the scroll of memory, looks down upon her firstborn child, who plays the lyre as though she is remembering the song inscribed in her mother's scroll. In this way, lawfulness and memory, belonging to the original principles of origin, are brought into the new order, creating the next stages of differentiation, inspiration and understanding. Zeus unites with his sister Demeter, goddess of the harvest, who gives birth to Persephone, who is carried into the underworld by Hades, becoming symbolically the seed beneath the earth. Here's Persephone and Hades in the underworld, holding the fruits of the earth in winter. The ritual of her return to the upper world each spring as the new shoot was celebrated every autumn for over 2,000 years in the Eleusinian Mysteries, becoming a symbol of death and rebirth for all creation. There was also a union between Zeus and Leto, daughter of the titan divinities of Koyos and Phoebe, sun and moon. Leto in turn gives birth to Artemis, goddess of the moon, huntress and guardian of the animals, here feeding a swan. She wears a spotted animal skin over her shoulder with a decorated quiver, recalling her ancient role as goddess of the wild animals, long preceding Zeus. The brother of Artemis was Apollo, god of clarity and form, also of poetry and song, music, dance, prophecy and healing. Here's Apollo playing the lyre that Hermes gave him, pouring a libation. Hermes, the trickster god of imagination, was born in a dusky cave far from the eyes of human beings. 
His father was Zeus and his mother was Maya, the shy goddess, the eldest of the seven sisters of the constellation of the Pleiades, daughters of Atlas and Pleione. Hermes is flying over the clouds with his winged sandals, holding the lyre he made from the shell of a tortoise, with his caduceus leading the way, originally male and female serpents intertwined around a central pole as a symbol of reconciliation of opposites. Not last or least, Zeus also unites with Metis, goddess of forethought, whom he then swallows to outwit a prophecy that she would bear a child greater than himself. So Athena had to be born through his head, with Hephaestus the smith god cracking his head open with an axe. Nonetheless, she inherited the wisdom of her mother Metis and became guardian of the arts and crafts, such as steering a ship riding a horse, in peace and war, protecting heroes through reflection and good counsel. She gave the olive tree to Athens in a contest with Poseidon, who offered a horse, and so she became patron of the city. Only then does Zeus marry his sister, cow-eyed Hera, suggestive of a union with the native Pelasgian culture of animal husbandry, and thereafter continues his dalliances with many other goddesses and nymphs, bringing the history and lore of the land into the new imaginal story. Here's Zeus and Hera, temple bas relief. Then there is the ubiquitous, mysterious and dynamic god Dionysus. Plato, talking in the laws of different kinds of songs, suggests almost as an afterthought that the birth of Dionysus, I suppose, is called Dithyram. Dithyram was the Greek's name for an ecstatic song and dance, imagined as happening at the ritual birth of Dionysus, which was the wild and thrilling dance of spring, the renewal of the year, which was reenacted in the Greek tragedies. Aristotle writes that tragedy begins with the leaders of the Dithyram. The classical scholar Jane Harrison explains that Dionysus is born out of the Dithyram, that is, born out of a communal ecstasy in the ritual dances of celebration at the new year, and over the years is gradually detached from the rite and gathers a life and character of his own and only later is sculpted and painted in art. Come, O Dithyrambus, Bacchus, come, Bromios, come, and coming with you bring holy hours of your own holy spring. Dionysus was also incarnated in the Holy Bull, he who begins the ploughing and sowing of the new year in spring. The poet Pindar writes, Whence did appear the graces of Dionysus with the bull-driving Dithyram? The most striking image in dramatic form of the rebirth of the year spirit comes from Crete. The hymn of the Kurites, where it was both a Dithyrambic spring ritual and also an initiation. It was written down in the 3rd century BC, but is undoubtedly much older, leading back to Minoan times. Io, Koros, most great, I give you hail, Cronion, lord of all that is wet and gleaming. You have come at the head of your daimones 
to dictate for the year, O oh, march and rejoice in the dance and song. To us also leap for full jars, and leap for fleecy flocks, and leap for fields of fruit, and for hives to bring increase, and leap for our young citizens, and for goodly Themis. All the stories of Dionysus' birth are stories of rebirth. He is twice born, child of the double door. In Olympian myth, he was either torn from the burning womb of his mother Semele by Hermes and sewed into his father's thigh to be born a second time, or he was born as a horned infant and dismembered by the Titans into the lunar figure of seven or fourteen pieces while contemplating his image in the mirror. The Titans left the heart, which was then swallowed by his mother, Rhea or Demeter, from whom he was born again. Though since the mirror was believed to catch the soul as well as the image, his return was never in doubt. His various mothers are all involved with the seed, which dies beneath the earth in winter, to be born again in spring. Semele, whose name means seed, Demeter, goddess of the harvest, and in yet another tale, her daughter Persephone, or Kore, the feminine form of sprout, Koros. When, so it was said, her father Zeus appeared to her in a cave in Crete in the form of a snake. Pressing of the grape into wine became a symbol of transformation for plants and humans alike. In ancient Greece, this idea of rebirth was carried through the distinction between two kinds of life. Zoe, infinite life, and Bios, finite life in time. And both were found in the life of the moon. The light phases of the moon, dying into the dark and reappearing after three days as the thin, curved crescent of the new cycle, were understood as being reborn through immersion in the eternal. Bios returned to Zoe to be reborn. These stages were interpreted as common to both moon, earth and humanity, the lunar and human condition understood as alike. This model, coming originally from the way the moon's waning had been experienced as a gradual dying and the three days dark as a death, extended naturally into the periodic dissolution and regeneration of all beings, especially the seasons of plant as the source of food. The only difference was that in the returning crescent, the rebirth of the moon could be seen and witnessed, and tragedy, therefore, transformed into myth. In the rituals of Dionysus, the wine offered to the participants was understood to be the Zoe of the god. The lunar nature of Dionysus, born in one tale with horns like the crescent moon, gleams through his dismemberment into fourteen pieces, the fourteen days of the waning moon, a fact which reminded Herodotus of the Egyptian god Osiris. Osiris, also a lunar god, was himself dismembered into fourteen pieces by his brother Seth as the full moon, when the god was lamented, searched for, discovered and reconstituted as a whole at which mourning was changed into joy. All over the Near East, the dying and resurrected goddess or god, as the moon, the plant, the tree, the year and the sun, and later taking human form as Osiris, Inanna, Dumuzi, Tammuz, Sagrus, Attis, Adonis, Persephone, Orpheus, Bacchus and Dionysus, returned in due time to Zoe, which as Bios, lives and dies to live again. This archetypal pattern extends in the imagery, even into Christian symbolism, with the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, still time to the first full moon after the spring equinox.
Such was the tradition from which Dionysus arose, and all tragedies took place in the theatre dedicated to the god. When the intensity of the play became overwhelming, the Greeks would clap their hands and cry, Theos, God, it shines, it lightens. When the play was not working, the Athenians would shout, Uden Dionysos, it is not Dionysus. Or as the Homeric hymn to Dionysus has it, anyone who forgets you cannot remember a sacred song. Only later did Dionysus become a god of ecstasy, wine, transformation and renewal. Just as Zeus became a god of light, thunder and lightning. Dionysus, abducted by pirates, transforming the mast of the ship into vines and the pirates into dolphins. The relationship between the early Mycenaean culture in Crete, beginning around 2000 BC, and the later Pelasgian and Mycenaean cultures in Greece, around 800 BC, had always been recognised in art, ritual and custom. But it had never been confirmed through language. Astonishingly, it was not until 1952 that Michael Ventris, a classicist and philologist, deciphered Mycenaean Linear B writing on tablets found mostly in Crete by working out that they were an early form of Greek. This made it possible to read for the first time the original Mycenaean names of the gods and goddesses engraved into baked clay and to discover that many of the gods and goddesses assumed to have been native to Greece had been brought by the Mycenaeans themselves, probably sometime after the tsunami of around 1600 BC in Crete, following the massive volcanic earthquake nearby in Thera. In Linear B writing, Dionysus was called Di Wo Nu So. Hermes, the trickster god of imagination, comes up in Linear B tablets five times. One says, E my I, Areus, suggestive of Hermes the ram, an old fertility god. So also do Zeus, Dictaeus, Erinyes as Demeter, Eleuther as Artemis, Pion as Apollo, Atana as Athena, who is offered a jar of honey. Poseidon, Hera, as well as the Lady of the Labyrinth, Lady of Grain, Priestess of the Winds, among others. In Mycenaean Greek, Ma-Ka is transliterated as Ma-Ga, containing the root Ga, which gives us Mother Gaia. The earlier Minoan writing called Linear A has not been deciphered. So many of the Greek myths may now be seen as a unique synthesis of two originally separate cultures. For when the nomadic sun and storm god-oriented Achaeans entered the land of the native earth and moon goddess-oriented Pelasgians, an entirely new creative fusion of both cultures was born. Here's Odysseus lashed to the mast, resisting the sirens. This fusion brought forth the gods and heroes of Hesiod's Theogony and Works and Days and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey in the 8th century BC, with their distinct personalities, their passionate goals and relationships, and their all too familiar virtues and vices. These characters and their destinies were further explored in the 5th century through the plays of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, among others. Though for Nietzsche, in his book The Birth of Tragedy, all the heroes of tragedy were but masks of Dionysus, he whose other name was Pentheus, suffering. Greek artists of the 6th and 5th century BC 
often depicted the relationship between the new Mycenaeans and the native Pelasgians as a dramatic conflict of values, where the divine god or hero tests himself against the native goddess or heroine, and new energies are released, which change the nature of things, and a new equilibrium is achieved. These stories are now called hero myths. Heros meaning sacred. Yet the wisdom of a goddess, usually Athena and often the god Hermes also, are necessary for the hero to survive. Here's Perseus slaying the Gorgon. Perseus, the legendary founder of Mycenae, son of Zeus and Danae, a mortal woman, is sent by the malicious king of Seriphos, who has imprisoned his mother, to bring back the head of the Gorgon, whose glance turns everyone to stone. He wasn't expected to survive. The goddess Athena gives Perseus a mirror to see the Medusa only in reflection, so he did not have to look at her. The Gorgon here is holding in her lap her horse Pegasus, son of Poseidon, who once released, flies to Mount Helion to be with the Muses, daughters of Nemogene. Here's Perseus escaping on the winged sandals of Hermes after slaying the Gorgon. Athena, with her long staff, is urging him to leave. And here's Athena protecting Theseus, whose task was to slay the Cretan Minotaur. The gift of Ariadne's thread to guide the way, the lunar weaving of old, allowed Theseus to find the centre of the dark labyrinth. Athena is here depicted as the guardian and inspiration of the heroic quest. Here's Athena with the gorgon's head upon her gown, watching over Jason as he seizes the golden fleece. In another, probably older, version of the myth, Athena in her cloak of snakes, reminiscent of the Minoan goddess, is bringing Jason out of the underworld, from death to life. The golden fleece is hanging on the tree above the serpent's head. But without the blessing from the goddess, The hero often suffers or dies, as did the hunter Actaeon, who offended the goddess Artemis, surprising her while she was bathing, and was torn apart by his own hounds. Yet while the new order gave a voice to the images of the old order, reaching back at least a thousand years earlier, it also dramatised a new kind of story, in which the god is the active player and the goddess carries the values which make the action matter, giving it perspective and meaning. But the goddesses are not so often the primary agents of their own dramas, as the ancient images of Minoan Crete suggest they once were. We no longer see, for instance, the Minoan goddess holding up the snakes of life and death in her hands. It is all the more significant, then, that Gaia, mother goddess Earth, persists in the new Olympian conversation. In the imagination of ancient Greece, Gaia was never left behind as a legend at the beginning of things. Whenever the drive of creation was required to reach a new level, 
she continued to play an essential role, and crucially in the movement of the seasons and the renewal of the year, which involve the rhythmic cycles of life, death and rebirth in all creation. It is Gaia who initiates the drama by growing a magical Narcissus with a hundred blooms as a snare for Persephone, whose other name Kore means shoot. So enticing is the Narcissus that Persephone picks it, ending the plant's life above ground, and so falls into the dark underworld, herself dropping as the seed, where she becomes the bride of Hades, death. Through Demeter's rage at the loss of her daughter, which turns the land barren, Persephone returns every spring as the reborn shoot to her mother, Demeter, goddess of the harvest, Gaia's own granddaughter. This natural drama was the source and inspiration of the Eleusinian Mysteries, celebrated every autumn for over 2,000 years in Eleusis, becoming a symbol of death and rebirth for all creation. Here's the reunion of Demeter and Persephone as the spring. To summarize, Gaia was the intelligence within creation. She brought time into being and freed it from the eternal round. She was the mover of growth as the cycle of birth, death and rebirth and the timing of growth in the seasons. She was the home for the dead and the container for the imagining of death through her granddaughter Demeter and Demeter's daughter Persephone. The dead were called Demetrioi. Gaia was the first oracle of prophecy at Delphi, a word which itself means womb, handing over to her daughter Themis, who was later replaced in the new hierarchy by Zeus's son Apollo. Priestesses sitting in the hot sun beside cracks in the rock would still open the Delphic rituals with an invocation to Gaia. I give first place of honour in my prayer to her, who of the gods first prophesied, Gaia. In this way, Gaia continued to be honoured as a living presence, whose laws were written into the lives of all creation. It followed that Gaia's law was related to the moral law of human beings or as we might say, nature and human nature at the deepest level, were not separately configured. In other words, the order of nature was for the Greeks a dynamic moral order implicating human life. A legendary way of saying this is to have the first king crowned by Gaia. And so it was that Erichthonius, the first king of Athens, was born vicariously by the semen of Hephaestus, son of Hera, the blacksmith of the gods, falling into the fruitful womb of earth. Athena, patron of Athens, escaping rape from Hephaestus, had brushed away his semen onto the ground, which Gaia had received in her capacious lap, nourished it, and in due time brought forth the child into the light. Offering him back to Athena, who offered him in turn as king of Athens. We can see that Gaia was an image far beyond what many people generally mean now by Earth. She was the mother who brought forth the universe from herself, so all her children were children of the universe, formed from her substance, sharing in her sacred source. Yet Gaia was also the everyday Greek word for earth, the soil we dig, the ground we tread upon. Only the context distinguished them. The earth who gives us grain was also the mother who feeds the world. The two terms were permeable to each other, so the early Greek mind could move fluidly between them without having to reach for a different kind of language to explain which one was meant. So Gaia, as goddess, globe and ground, 
was always transparent to the deeper poetic vision. This is shown in Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, who draws on earth intimately related to the moral life of humanity, from which it followed that Gaia's law could be profoundly disturbed by the unlawful and immoral behaviour of human beings. Oedipus became king of Thebes by answering the question of the Sphinx. What goes on four feet in the morning, two feet at noon, and three feet in the evening? A person, he replied. A person, as a baby in the morning of their life, crawls on four feet, hands and knees. As an adult in the noon of their life, they walk on two feet, and in the evening of life, the two feet need a stick, making three feet. Once he is king, Oedipus is quite content in his unconsciousness until Earth suffers. Suddenly, the land of Thebes begins to die. A blight is on the fruitful plants of the Earth. A blight is on the cattle in the fields. A blight is on our women that no children are born to them. It is Gaia's protest which initiates the drama of Oedipus's awakening to who he is and what he has done, the slaying of his father and the marrying of his mother. Reluctantly, Oedipus sends to the Delphic oracle of Phoebus Apollo to reveal the cause. The oracle, whose first law was Know Thyself, and whose second law was nothing in excess, now defines for all time the meaning of pollution as a human crime against the divine order, the profaning of what is sacred. King Phoebus, in plain words, commanded us to drive out a pollution from our land, pollution grown ingrained within the land. The pollution is the presence of the new king, who does not know himself and has acted in excess. But when Oedipus discovers that he is himself the pollution, he leaves the city, and harmony between the human and divine order is restored, and earth comes back to life. It is significant that even without Oedipus's intention to do wrong, Pollution occurred. Later, in reverse, in Sophocles' Oedipus at Colonus, the place Colonus where the older and wiser Oedipus is to lay his body in the earth, will bring blessing to the people who live there. Again, Gaia and the children of Gaia are shown to be profoundly related. So here, what happens to humans happens to earth, and what happens to earth happens to humans. The soul of the one is also the soul of the other. Or to put it another way, the human story and the universe story are one and the same. Ancient Greek culture lives on in the imagination of the West in more ways than we probably know, and especially perhaps in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the story of the Trojan War, and then Odysseus's journey home to Ithaca, his home island, which has become a symbol for all kinds of journeying and the many ways of coming home. To end with the Greek 20th century poet Kavafi's poem called Ithaca. Translated by Edmund Keeley. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, 
full of discovery. Lystrigonian, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lystrigonian, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when, with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbours you're seeing for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfumes of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvellous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you'll have understood by then what these Ithacas mean.